Hey everyone, thanks again for joining us for Sunday School this week as we continue to look at the life of Jesus utilizing the Gospel Project curriculum. Last week we met a man named Nicodemus who met with Jesus in, in secret. This week we're going to see another encounter. See, Jesus is traveling from Judea to Galilee. It was a quick, but the route he took wasn't common. It took him through this area called Samaria, an area that most Jews would avoid. The Samaritans were considered half-breeds, whose forefathers were Jewish, but they had actually intermarried with the Assyrians. A result of their history meant that they were despised by many Jews. But see, Jesus rejected the culturally acceptable route that went around the Samaritans. Instead, he took the direct route, and this decision placed him at Jacob's well around noontime. And it was here that he meets this woman, and he begins to have a conversation with her, asking her for a drink of water. But the woman's response included an element of surprise. She's like, don't you realize I'm a Samaritan? She saw herself as out of bounds and cast out by the Jews and perhaps devalued because of her ethnicity. But Jesus advanced the conversation in a way that implied this conversation was God's gift to her. He steered their discussion about water to the need for living water only God can offer, the gift of salvation, the gift of God himself through the work of Jesus the Son and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And to a woman whose soul longed for satisfaction, Jesus spoke of a living water that would quench spiritual thirst. See, all of us are thirsty. We're all longing for something that will satisfy us completely. We often try to satisfy that with that thirst with sin, either with things that are inherently sinful or with things that become sinful when we put them in place of God in our lives. And how we each try to satisfy our thirst looks different from person to person, but the need is the same in every circumstance. We are in need of Jesus and connection with him to fulfill our deepest longings. So what have you filled your longing with? Where have you tried to quench your thirst? See, we, we do this all the time. What well do you continue to return to in order to get satisfaction? Some turn to tobacco or alcohol. Some turn, turn to uh, pornography. Maybe it's image, the way that people see you. And so you spend most of your life trying to create an image or live up to an image. Adults do this too all the time, by the way. Buying the right house in the right neighborhood with the right vehicle in the driveway. The problem is that it is never enough. We constantly return to these things that just keep us going back, never truly satisfying. What well are you constantly returning to for your satisfaction? is that Jesus offers us a different way. In John 4, he says this, A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. Jesus said, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the well that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. So what exactly is that living water? Well, it's the gift of the Holy Spirit who grants eternal life to those in whom he dwells. It's salvation. See, Jesus made this gift possible for us, his enemies, by his death on the cross in our place. Jesus paves the way for abundant life in the Spirit for all those who recognize their need for his salvation and draw near to him in faith. 
Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and is here now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Debates about the proper way to worship are familiar to most of us. People have opinions about what time church services should start, how long they should be, what ministries should be available, what Bible translation churches should use, what styles of music are appropriate, what types of dress are acceptable, whether there should be chairs or pews, even what color the carpet should be. Opinions are rampant, and they're fine to have, but if we're not careful, our personal preferences about the physical spaces in which we worship can override our understanding of biblical worship. The Bible makes it clear that our physical space of worship are not in need of perfection, nor are they even essential. Jesus pointed out to the Samaritan woman that the time had come when the physical space she worshipped in would not matter. In her case, the debate was whether God should be worshipped on the certain mountain, as the Samaritans believed, or on Mount Moriah, as the Jews believed. Jesus issued the surprising statement that worship no longer needed to be defined by a geographical boundary. Rather, what is important about worship is that it is done in spirit and truth. Because God is spirit, a non-material divine being, so must our worship be in spirit, specifically in the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth. Let's continue on in John 4. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Throughout the Gospels, Jesus was hesitant to proclaim his identity outright when traveling and teaching amongst the Jews. He likely wanted to avoid the political and military baggage many Jews had attached to their expectation for the Messiah. With the Samaritan woman, however, Jesus came right out and said it. He could not have been any clearer. Jesus is the long-anticipated Messiah, the promised one who has come to save his people. And as the Messiah, Jesus accomplished the work of reconciling us to God. He is the sacrificial lamb who takes away the sin of the world. The means by which our broken relationship with God is restored and renewed. It is His perfect righteousness that is presented to the Father on our behalf for our justification. He is the triumphant King who delivers His people and restores all of creation. If we trust that Jesus is who He says He is, then He is our salvation. So when the Samaritan woman learned of Jesus' identity as the Messiah, she went back to her town and shared with her people. Since the woman came to the well in the heat of the day, when other women were unlikely to be there, it is probable that she was some kind of social outcast, perhaps because of her history with men. But she did not let her past sin stop her from sharing about Jesus. She was so excited that she told everyone about Jesus, wondering, could this be the Messiah? Through sharing the testimony of her encounter with Jesus, many of the Samaritans believed in him. Her story drew others to his side. And what was the result? Continuing in John 4, we see this. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified, He told me everything I ever did. So what does your testimony say about who Jesus is?
our testimonies can work in the same way. Sharing with our neighbors about the ways Christ has worked in our lives and spreading the news that He is the Messiah invites people to come to Him themselves. Encountering Jesus as the Messiah ought to inspire us to tell others about Him. We shouldn't be able to resist telling our neighbors about him any more than we can resist sharing when we've just aced the final exam or when we we've won a free car or when a loved one is finally cancer free and we shouldn't want to resist telling people Jesus is the Messiah and this is amazing news but often instead of yielding to the Holy Spirit as he leads our hearts to share Jesus with others we enter into a battle with him over control in our lives, over our social standing, our, our reputation, our status and dignity. The good news is Jesus still wants to meet us there in his loving kindness that leads us to repentance so our lives can echo again his glory to those around us. And it was at this time the disciples arrived. It was a pivotal moment of Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman after having ventured into town to find food. They wondered about his motives for breaking cultural protocol, for ignoring ethical and cultural barriers. While they were questioning in their hearts what Jesus was doing, the Samaritan woman left her water jar and ran back into town. As soon as she understood that Jesus was the Messiah, she dropped everything and told others about him. We can learn from them. We and probably identify with, with both of these reactions. Christians, among all people, should be least concerned about maintaining cultural and social expectations if it means getting the gospel to those who have not heard. Our reaction should be like that of the Samaritan woman who responded to Jesus by telling others about him. So how do we do that? How do we go about sharing the gospel? Well, here's some tips. First, we need to understand what is sin. In Romans 3, it tells us that we have all sinned and fall short of the standard that God expects. See, sin is rebellion against God. It is both committing actions that God prohibits and also failing to do the things God commands. Ultimately, the consequence of sin is eternal death in Romans 6.23. So what does God want? Well, 2 Peter 3.9 tells us that God desires that no one would uh, be sentenced to eternal death, but that everyone would turn to him and away from sin. In Romans 5.8, it it says that even though we are sinners, Christ died for us. God made a way for us to be saved. John 3.16, whoever believes, whoever trusts in the saving power of Jesus through his resurrection will not face eternal death, but will face eternal life. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, meaning only through him can we be saved. Before Christ, sin could only be taken away temporarily through the sacrifice of unblemished animals. But Jesus, who lived a sinless life, made himself a sacrifice and took our place and received our punishment so we could take his place and have eternal life. So how should we respond? Well, Romans 10 tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is the master of our lives and we believe that God raised him from the dead, we will receive eternal life. There are no tasks that we can do or boxes we can check to deserve this gift of salvation. In Acts 2, we're called to repent, which means to turn from a selfish and sinful life and make God's will our first priority. We are also told to be baptized as a way to publicly identify ourselves with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. So how should we live? As Christians, we are commanded to be like Christ. Though we will never be perfect, we strive to be like him every day. It may require sacrifice and discomfort at times. We are promised a reward we will never comprehend until we receive it. We are to, to tell others about Jesus and what he has done for them. Acts 2.42 says that we are to be devoted to reading scripture, to spend time with each other, to remember Christ's sacrifice through communion together. And we should seek unity, make sure that no one is in need, and we should gather to worship. As you read through the New Testament, there is so much teaching that helps us to understand how we can live in a way that pleases God. But along with all these things, seek out a person who will mentor you, who will keep you accountable, and will disciple you. And then it's your turn. And then you need to turn around. Once you have that, and once you have begun being held accountable and discipled, then you need to take it upon yourself to disciple someone else. See, Jesus had this amazing interaction with this woman where he saw her and he broke through social and cultural barriers. The disciples also saw her and they, they saw a cultural barrier and a social barrier and they weren't willing to break that down. And Jesus shows us 
how to do that. By, by preaching the good news of eternal life through His Son, Jesus. See, that's good for everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, uh, where you're from, or what you look like. The good news is good news 